Well, hello everybody and uh, welcome um, to Ben's Book Club, uh, which is our monthly gathering where we look to speak to authors about books on themes of the 18th century, Benjamin Franklin and um, American history. Uh, this month, uh, I am delighted to speak to Kate Chisholm, uh, who wrote the book Fanny Burney, Her Life. And she is the author of three books, including Fanny Burney, Her Life, and used to write about radio for The Spectator magazine. She is a former Royal Literary Fund Fellow and Hawthorne Fellow. Um, so welcome, Kate. Thank you for having me. Um, it's really good to be able to talk about Fanny Burney, which I wrote quite a long time ago. So if I, if I, if I have a senior moment and don't quite remember it, please apologize. But um, it was a long time ago I wrote that book, <laughs> yes. Well, I think, I think that she is um, an evergreen character, if you will. I think that even, I think you can continue to speak about her for forever almost because she she has done so much she wrote about so much and we have so much to learn from her um so i was just kind of wondering what led you to write about fanny burney well i i'm i suppose practically i was looking to write a biography um because i wanted to write a book and i realized that biography was probably the easiest kind of book to write because you have all your facts you just and you have the narrative structure you just have to put it together um, and you don't have to worry about structure in that sense. Um, and I, I wanted to write about a South African writer, Olive Schreiner, but there was a very good biography of her already by Ruth First. Um, so, um, and then I just was on a train going up to Edinburgh. No, I was, I was, I was in Hatchard's bookshop, and I picked up um, Evelina by Fanny Burney, her first novel, um, and was reading it on the train up to Edinburgh. I was going up to Edinburgh for the weekend or something, and I just thought, this is extraordinary. I'd read George at Hare a lot when I was young, and I thought this is George at Hare, but it's by written by somebody who was there. I mean, it was it was for real, and I was immediately taken and drawn to it. And then I went, then I just had to start reading about her and trying to find out who she was and what kind of life she'd led and how she come to write these novels. And I just got more and more interested um, because she had such an extraordinary life and an extraordinary family as well. It wasn't just her. She had a, a very rich family with brothers and sisters who all did quite interesting things. And um, I also was a, a little bit disappointed by some of the books, the biographies that I read of her because they, they made her quite um, sort of quite static and quite... Um, uh, they didn't really have the freshness of the novels or the slight cheekiness of the novels. They were a bit sort of respectable and and there's a sense in the novels in which she wasn't quite respectable or there were bits of her that were not respectable. And I wanted to draw that out a bit more. Um, and at the same time, there, were, there was a new move towards making her more of a feminist heroine, um, which is a bit of a stretch of the imagination because although she was cheeky and I would say she was a bit radical, there's no way you could describe Fanny Burney as a feminist. It just didn't seem to ring true. But I wanted to defend her from, from, from accusations of not, uh, of being a bit um, too respectable. So, so, that, so, so, so I, I just began researching and thought, this is the person I want to write about. And, uh... She definitely comes to life on the page um, when you when you read what she what she's written and, and also I think that um, in the book which I have I have with me <laughs> um, I, I think you do a, a good job at bringing out the the cheekiness and um, but I was wondering because I know that recently the British Library actually digitized a lot of of her uh, writings but when you were writing the book um, what were the sources that were available? Um, and did this affect the research and writing process? Yeah, I mean, there's you know, sort of 10,000 or more letters, Bernie letters, both Fanny Bernie letters and family letters. And so there's a huge archive. And a lot of them, there's quite a lot in the British Library, but a lot of them are in the New York Public Library, uh, but they're also at New Haven, Princeton. They're all over the place, actually. So it was a bit daunting when I first started. I'm thinking, how am I going to get to read all these letters? And I was in touch with, I was advised to get in touch with someone, a very nice, kindly Bernie scholar who sadly has since died, um, a man called Alvaro Ribeiro. And I, just, I remember having this phone conversation with him and he said, well, what you need to do is go to Canada. Because in Canada, uh, the McGill University in Montreal, um, there was a professor there, Joyce, um, Joyce Hemlow, who wrote 
a biography in 1950s and it's the sort of it was the standard biography it became the standard biography it was very thorough and then she's then set about um, um, an edition of um, the letters edited properly and um, tried to restore to the sort of uh, the state in which Fanny Burney had written them because um, previous publications of the letters had always followed um, a, a heavily edited heavily deleted versions of the letters and this was an attempt to bring them back to how Fanny Burney had actually written them. Um, so Joyce Hemlow set up this thing at McGill and got lots of funding from the Canadian government to um, both write her biography and to, and to publish the letters and as a result they, they, they collected transcripts of all these letters so basically that was the place where you could go and read all the letters in transcript. Um, so I went there for I basically spent about six weeks in Montreal reading the letters, um, reading, reading, reading. <laughs> um, and I did that to begin with. And then I realized that that was great because it took me right inside and gave me a full view of the life, if you like. But there is nothing like reading the original letter. You have to do that as well. So I went to New York and spent some time in New York, um, but I you know, was able to spend less time than I would have done reading the letters that I felt were most important. So I read the letter which she writes to her sister Hetty nine months after she had the mastectomy and she describes the mastectomy. And I read that in manuscript and it's just, it's a, an experience you'll never really forget because it's such a striking description. I mean, she doesn't flinch from going into absolute detail of the pain and, and exactly what the surgeons were doing. Um, it's an extraordinary letter. There's another really poignant letter, the last letter written by her son to her. He dies in his 40s. Um, sort of a, a slightly failed life in a way. And there's a very sad letter that he writes to her at the very end of his life. So that was a kind of memorable thing to read in manuscript. And, and, and it gives you such access in some way into the story into the person by some kind of intangible um, connection that you make through reading the actual handwriting. Yeah. And yeah, there is there is nothing like having the actual manuscript. So I'm I'm hoping that soon, you know, with um, the COVID, at least here in the UK, the COVID restrictions being. Um, you know, the, the slow uneasing of the restrictions, um, you know, you'll have more access to these, uh, to places like the, I mean, the British Library is open, but it is true looking at these, these papers um, in person always makes you feel more connected to the characters or the people who wrote them. Um, I know that for us at Benjamin Franklin House, you know, Benjamin Franklin, he wrote so much. And so, um, although we, we don't have at the house, uh, a lot of original writings, you know, manuscripts by him, um, you do feel a lot closer to those people. Um, and I was wondering, what would it have been like for a, a young woman like Fanny Burney um, in the 18th century? Yeah, I mean, I think it's always important to realize that, you know, there's this kind of standard picture and, and women were independent. Um, I was reading, um, a, a, a book the other day which was about uh, publishing and the, the, it's surprising the number of women who were working as printers and publishers in the 18th century so there were lots of independent women who were running businesses and things like that and I think it's always important to remember that but in Fanny Burney's case I mean she would never have gone out without a chaperone or with somebody else she wouldn't have walked the streets alone that was not that would just have been regarded as being too dangerous um she was not educated beyond primary level she went to a school when she was young up to the age of about 11 but after that she had no education um, her sisters were sent away to school in france they were sent to a convent school in france but either because they felt that fanny was not strong enough um emotionally to to, to leave home in that way um, at sort of 12, 13, or they were more worried that she would become Catholic by going to a camp. They thought she would, she was more likely to become Catholic if she went. I, these are the sort of theories that why she wasn't sent away to school, whereas her sisters did, we don't really know. Um, there was a huge furore when she refused the first man who proposed marriage to her, the family, and you know, it was huge family eruptions, um, but he wasn't a man she was interested in. But the fear was that what would happen to her when her father uh, you know, if her father died and she didn't have 
a man to support her. So, so that kind of situation. Um, she wanted to write, but she spent a lot of time copying her father's manuscripts. Her father was a writer, he wrote about music. And in fact, her first novel, Evelina, um, she copied it in a false hand, the whole manuscript in a false hand so that the printers wouldn't recognize her writing because she didn't want to be known as the author. Well, she probably did want to be known, but it wasn't regarded as being um, okay for, to be published at that time under your own name as a woman. It was regarded as too public for you to do that. So, so, um, so A, she, she had to spend a lot of time working on her father's books rather than her own. But secondly, she couldn't, she couldn't publish um, under her own name and she had to copy it all in a false hand. Um, she didn't negotiate directly with a publisher. I mean, lots of women did actually, but Fanny Burney didn't. Um, I think they were a slightly, shall we say, regarded as a slightly raffish family in a way. Her father was a music teacher. He was a musician. Um, her, one of her uncles was a dancing masters. They were performers and, and, and musicians and they weren't really, if you like, society people. And I think as a result of that, they were very conscious of their social position. So I think a lot of the reasons why she was much more perhaps prudish than other women, so some society women could, could afford to be more cavalier, if you like, but she, so um, she, didn't, uh, she, did, she didn't negotiate directly with publisher. Her first comedy and pro possibly her best was never staged. Um, um, it was, ref her father refused to allow her to take it to Drury Lane or Covent Garden and have it staged, even though people like Sheridan and Thomas Harris, people like that wanted to put her plays on stage, um, and Garrick, um, she, he didn't allow it. Um, in fact, Garrick died in 1779. If Garrick had still been alive, she may have got that through, but because um, uh, um, her father didn't want her to be, I think it was, probably because she would have had to have gone to the, the theatre, she would have had to have mixed with actresses, she would have had to have... And also Fanny herself was very shy. She possibly wouldn't have been able to direct the cast in the way that... Um, so her plays are a little bit raw in the sense they don't have that performance polish to them. Um, she went... She... After she published two novels, hugely successful novels. She still wasn't married and what was going to happen to her. She got the opportunity to, um, she was invited to go to court to become um, a keeper of the robes to the queen. Um, she was very reluctant to do this because she understood that if she did that, her life would be very confined, constrained. She'd have to dress up all the time. And Fanny Burney was not interested in clothes. Um, and in some ways that's quite disappointing in her novels. You don't get those descriptions of what people were wearing things by and large or in her diaries for that matter. Um, but, you know, her father thought it was fantastic because it was such a good social position. So she, she so, um, but in the end, um, this is where she shows her spirit. She ends up defying everybody by marrying a Catholic and a Frenchman and an emigre from the revolution. So this is what makes her interesting, I think. Uh, yeah, as a character, as a person, I should say. Yeah. And I believe one of the reasons why um, her father didn't want her to publish, uh, not publish, but to perform, to have the plays be performed was because, partly because the critics might be harsh and, um, you know, she might not be able to handle that kind of, that live critique of the audience um, while they're watching the plays. But also I believe that it was, uh, it, she was satirizing um, the blue stockings, this, the, the women's group, is that, is that correct? Um, yeah, I mean, her first play is called The Whitlings and it's basically surrounds, uh, it's based on a character called Lady Smatter, who may well have been modeled on Elizabeth Montague, the queen of the blue stockings, who was holding these salons and women were collecting together and talking about politics and literature and science. And, um, uh, and yes, I think, I think there, was, there was a fear that they would be recognize themselves in her play. Time. Because, I mean, Fanny Burney was a great cartoonist, if you like. Um, um, her cousin, actually, Edward Francisco Burney, was a, an artist, a brilliant artist, actually, a brilliant cartoon style artist. And it's nice to compliment the two, because you look at his cartoons of people and his drawings of London society, um, and he has them depicted on canvas, and, and Fanny Burney does it 
um, in, in words. It's a, it's a nice comparison. But um, yes, I think, I think um, it's, it's, it is highly, I think he was concerned about, about that, 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 that she, and I think he was concerned. I mean, uh, Fanny Boney would have taken criticism very badly, I think. She wasn't someone who had a, um, um, uh, what do you call it, a, a, a thick skin. She was very thin skinned. Yeah, yeah, she would, she was sensitive to, to any comment about her work. Which I mean, I fully understand. <laughs> it's a, it's a common thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's yeah. interesting because her um, her kind of caricatures of of the other people that she met over the course of her life was quite harsh sometimes. Yes. Yeah. So, she, so she, she could dish it out, but she wasn't so good <laughs> as, as actually taking it. Yes, and uh, um, I think that's quite common, really. Um, yes, she had a brilliant way of being able to. Um, sum up a person in sort of uh, three, three, three or four words, you know, she was civil, something unpleasing. Um, uh, um, we, you sort of get the sense of a, a stuffy woman. Um, uh, yes. Uh, so, yes, I think, I think, I think he, her father was right, to, was, was, was protecting her. Um, but yes, I think, I think that's what makes her, her, um, her book so sharp, her diary so sharp is the way she, she she's able to to she, she's fearless actually when she's writing, but when she's out in society she's quite fearful. So it's quite interesting, yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting because she she's often described by biographers as being kind of a, a very shy kind of person, and um, as we as we have discussed before we we uh, started recording for the session, um, she is she really comes to life and it's it's interesting but I guess that often happens when um you know when you're a, a writer and you don't necessarily um are able to kind of communicate socially um you you'd be able to write it on on the page um and I think that's probably why it resonated with so many people when when they read um her her books and her, her writing um but I wanted to get your take on kind of what made her different than the other um her contemporaries and uh, the other women of her time and, and and such yeah i think that's that's quite a difficult that's quite a difficult question i think I, uh to answer i think i think what interested me in her and what makes her different in a sense is is there are quite extreme contradictions as we just in a sense described that contradiction between the fact that she was fearful of criticism, she was shy in company. She didn't want to be noticed in company. But in her writing, she's way out there. She doesn't hold anything back. And in fact, they thought that Evelina was written by a man, Christopher Anstey. Actually, was the pop was a, who'd written a kind of spoof guide to Bath, and it, they thought it was written by a man because it was daring, if you like, in, in her way she describes people. I mean, in, in Evelina, for instance, she has a sort of old sea captain, this sort of gruff old sea captain who, who plays all these tricks on this woman called Madame Duval, who's this terrible old French woman. Um, and then she, there's this, there are extraordinary scenes in, in Evelina. There's one in which she has, um, she's describing the way that the law the, the betting is is endemic in 18th century society and extreme betting they would bet on anything and so that she has a, a group of old women running a race and all the men are betting as to which of these old women um, um, are going to win it's, it's quite savage um, and I remember when I was uh, I think it was when I was writing the book I'm trying to think it can't have been Little Britain because that wouldn't have been on then, I don't think, 20 odd years ago. But it was one comedy program that was a bit like that, that had a race between our women. And it's very uncomfortable to watch sort of people betting on a group of old women running. It's it's not a nice thing, you know, so she's not nice in that way. Um, uh, I think she's also different in the way that she in her diaries she's from a very early age from you know 14 15 she's very conscious of the fact that she's writing for posterity she's not just writing to um um uh, you know to sort of in the secret of her room although she is but she wants she wants she wants those diaries to be read later definitely and she says that somewhere about the posterity she also um she's very conscious of what she's doing. She says, I want to theatricalize my dialogue. So she wants, she's practicing to prepare for a, 
writing for the stage. So in a sense, that's a suggestion that she really did want to write for the stage. Um, I think she's different because of her ability to be where it mattered when it mattered. I mean, it's quite extraordinary. She, so she's in, she grows up in a house where all the important people come to the house because her father is a musician, but um, but he he's someone who knows everybody and they all come. He has these musical evenings and they all come to hear music played and to meet and talk. Uh, so, so she starts off there. He's a friend of Garrick. So Garrick comes around to the house. He, he, he's just been at Drury Lane and done Hamlet or Macbeth and he pops in to see them all and still in stage costume and entertains them. So, and then she's, um, and then she goes to court and she happens to be at court in the period where King George it, it suffers one of his bouts of madness or whatever you like to call it, whether it's madness or porphyria or, um, ill health <laughs> there's a debate about is exactly how you should describe that um so so, so so she observes all that and then she marries a frenchman and she goes to paris and she 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 sees paris under napoleon she experiences what it's like to live in what she calls a police um police state virtually um and then she's in brussels on the eve of waterloo and hears the guns and has to escape and come back to England um, in that in that period of, of ravaged uh, ravaged Europe, really. So so she 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 happens. To, so I think that's what makes her different. Is most people wouldn't be at the most pivotal points of history at the time throughout their life, if you like. Um, she even uh, goes to Buckingham House and meets the young the baby Queen Victoria, the future Queen Victoria. Um, she's about when. Um, when she's still a baby. Um, and then I think her ability to describe, uh, for instance, you know, her ability to describe the mastectomy without flinching uh, is an extraordinary piece of writing. Yeah. And uh, well, the, the account of the mastectomy, I think is is often quoted to this day by, by people who are, um, you know, undergoing treatment or um, who, who write about this because it is so raw and as you said, she always seems to be at the right place at the right time <laughs> in her life. Um, and so I think it, it's almost like she's making it up, but she's not. It's just, it's just her life. <laughs> um, so in some ways, she, I think that she's definitely achieved that theat theatricality because it does seem a bit, um, you know, you wouldn't think that somebody could have experienced all of that. Um, but it, it kind of speaks to how uh, London, well, the society is quite small. <laughs> mm. um, but she is quite a moving writer. I think that brings it back slightly to what she wrote when she was at court, um, the kind of the portrayal, obviously the portrayal of the madness, but also um, just the everyday, you know, family dynamics that she saw um, within the court, which is not a portrayal you see very much of the royals, um, especially from that period. Um, so she elicits quite a, quite a response in that way. And um, she's very observant, which I think is a good, a good skill for a writer. Um, but I know you mentioned before that you, you, didn't, you didn't think that the before you wrote the book, that you didn't think that the diaries that were portrayed, um, the, sorry, the um, the biographies didn't portray her in a way uh, that kind of echoed her writing. And I was just wondering if, do you think that she is portrayed fairly as a person from history? Is she, uh, is she portrayed fairly? Um, she's, <clears throat> it's complicated. Um, she herself edited her diaries massively before they were published. And she did a terrible thing as well. She wrote a biography of her father, um, a, a huge long um, uh, three volume work. And uh, she then destroyed all his letters. So, um, which is sort of um, a, um, a crime really <laughs> to do such a thing. Um, and so she, her presentation uh, she 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 self presents in that that way, and she kind of wants to ensure that her that the the, the the Fanny Burney we know is the one she wants us to know. So it's actually proved quite hard to go back underneath all that. Um, I think I th I think that 
it's quite hard to portray her fairly because she was so contradictory in a way. And I think every period, you know, biography is always a biography of, of someone. The reason you have so many different biographies of the same person is that each period wants to portray that person in the way that they see them. And so that's why, you know, there was a sort of great outpouring of feminist interpretations of Fanny Bunny, which there are elements of her which are obviously about women's independence and uh, I women's identity. I mean, the wonder is um, is all about women's identity. The, the, the heroine is called Ellis. Um, L is, um, you know, that so uh, the French L and is that 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 name is very important, and it's the, it's the theme of the book, if you like, how she ha, how she, her struggles to find her identity in a society which is not letting women establish their independent identities. So in that sense, it is a feminist novel, but at the same time, uh, there's many aspects of it which you know which you cannot sort of uh, uh, describe as as feminist. The the the, the, um, the most Attra attractive character is kind of vilified for being over dramatic and um, influenced by Mary Wollstonecraft and um, threatens suicide and, and, and overdoes it. Uh, Jul Julia Ellis herself, the, the main character, although she's struggling to establish her identity, she, she is a bit of a conformist and, and, and Fanny Burney doesn't really let rip with her in the same way that um, she might. So um, I, th I think it's quite hard to answer that question, really. I mean, um, I, th I, I didn't like the cover on the paperback that they gave. I should have changed that because I think that makes it quite twee. Um, and I feel that um, I prefer the cover on the hardback, which has this extraordinary picture of her with this hat on, the Lunardi bonnet named after the balloonist Lunardi. Um, because it, it sort of gives her much more strength as a personality, I feel. Um, so yes, I'm, I, I think the jury's still out on that one, really. I think there's still more to be, um, more to be said about her, really, yeah. Well, that just makes me think of kind of the, the contradictory nature of her and um, the fact that she she did write so strongly and had obviously opinions on people. Um, and yet a lot of the choices in her life, she turned to the, the men in her life to help oh. make those decisions for her. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I just was wondering from your opinion, if you think that that she did that because she felt like she was that was the only thing she could do or whether she was maybe trapped by society at the time or was she happy to be kind of in that conformist box I mean obviously you can't speak for her <laughs> but just from your from your um from your interpretation of her writing and her her diaries yeah I don't think she was a genuine she she preferred to conform yes I think that would be my understanding of her I mean in her marriage she always called Monsieur Darby her partner never her husband so she, she 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 saw herself in, in partnership in marriage, um, and but I think she was she she was no Mary Wollstonecraft, shall we say, in the sense that she didn't really want to overturn things or or destabilize anything in that sense. Um, she um, uh, she did always look to. To male figures as her kind of mentors so when she was younger she had this strange man called Mr Crisp as her mentor which is a slightly strange I think he's quite a strange and un, odd man actually um, but she was very influenced by him and she was very influenced by her father and as I said she's, she, she spent a lot of time writing up his memoirs um, and wanting to make sure that his memory was he was remembered in the right way um, so yes, I, I think, I think it's, I think she's a, con she's a natural conformist with a rebellious streak as opposed to a radical with a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. And I, I think you make the argument in the book as well, that her editing of 
of her father's writings um, potentially kind of hid a lot of the kind of the, the great stories that might be in there because she was editing it for, for public consumption and I'm sure to keep his reputation. Um, mm. So it's it's interesting again, again, that kind of her duality of um, writing so strongly, but then also kind of reining it in a little bit um, for posterity. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think I think I think that's what makes it interesting, though, that that sense in which she could be quite viciously observant about the way society is operating and the way people behave in society, the way they show off, the way they um, um, uh, undermine people and this kind of thing. She had no compunction about showing that and especially in her diaries she, she, she does that if you and, and they've done a lot of work in in uncovering some of the stuff that got that, that got uh, blacked out by her later because she was worried that people might think she was being too critical or, or whatever um but um for instance i suppose you know a classic example of, of of that is that she never supports hester thrale who then goes who um after her first husband dies uh, marries for what she says is love um, and, and has a sort of, um, uh, a, she marries an Italian musician and Catholic, which is regarded as being just totally beyond the pale. And um, she never forgives her for that. And they, they were, Hester Thrale had, had uh, entertained Fanny Burney a lot and introduced her to a lot of people at, at her, because uh, she, she had a, a, an estate and a house and, and entertained a lot. And she, she, she sort of took Fanny Burney up and, um, gave her a lot of encouragement and, 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 and took her into society in many ways and another kind of society. But when Hester Thrale marries Gabrielle Piozzi, um, Fanny Burney would have nothing more to do with that. And then particularly, actually, she had nothing to do with Madame de, She got very in a muddle with Madame de Stael, whom she met uh, when she met her French husband, uh, Monsieur D'Arblay. And... Uh, they meet in England because Madame de Staël is also in England and Madame de Staël had a pretty um, racy reputation for um, um, abandoning her Swedish husband and having affairs and um, Fanny Burney just would not have anything more to do with her. She just kind of cut her dead because um, she didn't want to be associated with a woman who was known to have affairs and things like that. So she, 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 she was, yes. <laughs> Yes, uh, yes, because she does seem to be quite morally conservative, which is, um, yeah. yeah, and I mean, I, I keep coming back to the fact that she's a contradiction, but that's just the way that she is. And actually, I think that's very indicative of a real person, that they're contradictory. You know, no, no one is, unless you're, you know, maybe a politician and you're trying to build a narrative, um, most people are contradictory in themselves. And um I think that if anybody were to read anybody's diaries over the years, they might be a little bit embarrassed <laughs> about what they wrote previously. Um, but how do you think her diaries and kind of books reflected 18th century London and society? I mean, she was morally conservative, but she observed so much. So um, how do you think it reflected the realities of 18th century London specifically? Well, I think Evelina in particular is a fantastic sort of, um, if you like, um, guide to London or uh, a sort of, um, uh, I can't think of the word, peer to London. I mean, she, she loves, she obviously loves London. She loves everything, um, the life in London. And, and Evelina, her character who comes up to London from the country, goes to all these places. So she goes to Vauxhall Gardens, she goes to Marylebone Gardens, she goes to the Tower um, and... Uh, she goes she goes to balls she goes to assemblies and they're written about with such verb and such um uh oh characterization that you're that you're taken right there with her um and she doesn't just write about the fashionable places she writes about some of the seedier places so she so she writes about Vauxhall gardens but she also writes about Marylebone gardens which are the sort of sub sub pleasure gardens and then Sadler's Wells which is where Sadler's Wells was where this kind of footmen and the, um, the, the, the ladies in waiting went when they were um, the uh, chambermaids and things went on their days off. They went to Sadler's Wells, whereas the fashionable were all congregating at Vauxhall Gardens. And she, she describes all these scenes with great verve. I mean, I did I did pull out a, a, a short passage from Marylebone Gardens from Evelina, if you wanted it, me to read that with that. Oh, yes. Yes, please. That would be great. Uh, because uh, it sort of gives a flavour of what she does. Um, if I can find it, I think it's here. 
no, which, oh no, it's here, it's where the pen is, yeah. So this is when she takes, they go to Marylebone Gardens, which as I say, is a sort of sub garden to Vauxhall Gardens. It's smaller, but it's also much seedier and where more, lots more racy things take place. So she's, she said, this garden, as it is called, is neither striking nor for magnificent nor for beauty. And we were all so dull and languid that I was extremely glad when we were summoned to the orchestra upon the opening of a concert, in the course of which I had the pleasure of hearing a concerto on the violin by Mr. Buff Thelemon, who to me seems a player of exquisite fancy, feeling and variety. When notice was given us that the fireworks were preparing, we hurried along to secure good places for the site. But very soon we were so encircled and in incommoded by the crowd that Mr. Smith proposed the lady should make interest for a form to stand upon. This was soon effected, and the men then left us to accommodate themselves better, saying they would return the moment the exhibition was over. The firework was really beautiful and told with wonderful ingenuity the story of Orpheus and Eurydice. Eurydice. But at the moment of the fatal look, which separated them forever, there was such an explosion of fire and so horrible a noise that we all, as of one accord, jumped hastily from the form and ran away some paces, fearing that we were in danger of mischief from the innumerable sparks of fire which glittered in the air. For a moment or two, I neither knew nor considered whither I had run, but my, re my recollection was soon awakened by a stranger's addressing, with me, addressing me with, come along with me, my dear, and I'll take care of you. I started, and then to my great terror perceived that I had outrun all my companions and saw not one human being I knew. With all the speed in my power and forgetful of my first fright, I hastened back to the place I had left, but found the form occupied by a new set of people. In vain, from side to side, I looked for some face I knew. I found myself in the midst of a crowd, yet without party, friend or acquaintance. I walked in disordered haste from place to place without knowing which way to turn or whither I went. Every other moment I was spoken to by some bold and unfeeling man, to whom my distress, which I think must be very apparent, only furnished a pretense for impertinent witticisms or free gallantry. And so it goes hard. But I, I think that gives a sort of sense in which she describes these places and, and uh, what, what happens and the sort of breathless pace in which it's written. Um, yeah. Um, which seems probably like the breathless pace of society. <laughs> I think it was pretty fast because they had a credit boom in the, in the sort of time she was writing it, the early mid to 1770s, much like the 1980s, if you like. I think it was very similar in that sense. Everything, lots was happening, lots was, there was a huge boom in, in uh, social life and, and, and uh, um, expenditure on social life. So the gardens were booming and yes, lots of people were just spending a lot of money, <laughs> yes. Yeah. And uh, she she lived actually so uh, close to where Benjamin Franklin House is today, which is close mm. to the theaters and and all that. So I'm sure she would have been. And of course, you know, the, the artists going through her her everyday life at the home. So I'm sure that she experienced that pace all the time, essentially, because that was just the way the people were living. And I guess if you're also in that artistic community, you probably feel it even more. And maybe that creativity helped her in terms of inspiring her writing um, because she was around so much creativity and, and society. I think I think very much so. I mean, her father was incredibly busy teaching music and he'd sort of go around London in his coach and he'd eat sandwiches, the sort of, um, you know, the Earl of Sam, the, 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 Sam he, she talks about eating sandwiches because uh, he was on the run the whole time, yes. And, uh, um, and you know they'd go to the opera house and they'd, they'd go to the morning in the morning to, to listen to rehearsals and things like that or as I said Garrett would call in on the on his way home from the theatre um, still in costume um, and sort of would entertain them they were young sort of young sort of teenagers at that time and uh, she lost her mother when she was very young and the Garrett was very kind to them all and he gave them a dog and, and sort of his wife too and they, they he, he would just pop in to see them and, and, and cheer them up basically yeah uh but yes i think i think i think it was a very uh london was a musical center then wasn't it it's was a sort of uh opera it was one of the centers for opera at, in europe at the time uh lots of french and italian singers were coming to london to perform so it, it had that uh busy um yes quality yeah well we often tell a story at benjamin franklin house about benjamin franklin of how um he he would go to the theater 
And sometimes he wouldn't come back to his house in time for the curfew that his landlady had imposed <laughs> on the house. So, um, so I think definitely, especially um, in the in the 18th century, I'm sure, especially kind of this close in this area, which is close to Covent Garden, it was probably very very busy. <laughs> yeah, lots of ladies of the night in Covent Garden. So, <laughs> um, but. Uh, yeah, I think uh, it was an outdoor life. Yeah, they lived. Yeah, they lived on the street, and uh, it was much more um, in London. Um, I think, and and people, there were lots of stew houses where people would go and get a cheap meal, and uh, Johnson did that quite a lot. Or they, there were shared community ovens. People would take their their meat to cook in a shared oven, and that kind of thing. So it was very much a sort of coming and going kind of place. Yeah. Mm. Well, uh, back to specifically about Fanny Burney, but. Um, what do you think we can learn from her? Oh, I think she gives a real insight into life in London, as we were just describing in a way. I think uh, people use her diaries for knowledge about medicine because she describes, I mean, obviously, particularly her mastectomy, but her husband dies um, uh, of cancer and she describes the treatments that were not available, you know, they sort of, they were treating it with rhubarb and things like that, but they sort of, she describes that kind of thing, but also other sort of um, smaller illnesses that she describes. Um, she, it's a brilliant insight into the court. And I think it's quite interesting, all the sort of current shenanigans about Prince Harry and stuff like that. I mean, she really does describe the stifling, um, routines and boredom of being at court and the, the sort of rigidity of the etiquette so she sort of describes how if you're stand if you're in the royal presence you're not allowed to cough and so you she has this hilarious uh, long uh, description of uh, of how how you pre how you swallow a cough basically and how you <laughs> nearly sort of asphyxiate yourself in the process it's hilarious it's very funny she also describes the, the terrible business of having to withdraw backwards um, you weren't allowed to turn round in front of the uh, king and queen. You had to re retreat backwards. Um, she describes how when they, you know, when when they when 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 they went on a royal sort of visit, um, she would have to stand waiting on. Uh, so the king and queen would be having their dinner, but the 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 the, 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 the retinue, if you like, the the ladies in waiting and the keepers of the robe were not allowed to, to sit down, who didn't sit down and eat, obviously, with the, the king and queen. They just had to stand there and wait. So they had no dinner or anything, and they had to wait until that was all over before they could have anything to eat. That, that, the, the terrible boredom of having to get up at the same time every day. So she had to get up at six to be ready at seven if the queen wanted her to help dress. And then you go through the rhythm of prayers at eight and, 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 and sort of hairdressing then came at nine and this kind of thing. Um, um, and there's the sort of lack of um, uh, friendship that was there really in some, uh, she was very lonely in court and uh, didn't, I mean, she, Queen Charlotte was very kind to her and she liked Queen Charlotte, but um, she did find uh, it stiflingly dull, yeah. And I think you, you also said in the book that, that this, that's probably what um, reinvigorated her writing, that she went back to writing because yeah. Um, yeah. Of, because it was so dull and not what she expected. And um, that I, there's also a very amusing passage about how she, she describes how she's she, when they're when they are walking, she has to be even behind the chambermaids and <laughs> and yeah. all that. But she's yeah. not at, she's not it, although it was obviously a very privileged position to be in the court. Um, that it wasn't exactly what she would have maybe expected from such a such a privileged position. So, yeah, I mean, I think she was she she was startled. I think to realize she was a servant. You know, she's suddenly become a servant. And so she, I think it actually informs her writing, particularly of The Wanderer, because she really understands what it's like to be, to be, to, to wait on people. She never would have experienced that before. And um, how that saps your sense of um, individuality. And, uh, um, and that comes through very strongly in The Wanderer, where um, Juliet, the heroine, has to find work to make a living because she doesn't have any income. And she goes through all these different jobs. She's a companion to a crusty old lady and um, she tries to earn a living as a music teacher. Um, and that being dependent on other people, uh, 
she really describes that. And I'm sure that all came out of the court experience. Yeah. Well, I say that I'm sure, <laughs> but I have a, I have a strong feeling that that might have uh, come out of the court experience. Yes. Yeah. Well, before we move on to audience questions, I have a question for you. Uh, <laughs> what new projects are you working on currently? Well, I'm doing two major things, really. One of which is I just um, I'm helping on. Uh, they're, they're doing a digi digital edition of the Mo Elizabeth Montagu letters. She was the queen of the blue stockings, this extraordinary woman who um, wrote books. Um, and but, but most of all was a patron, really. Uh, supporting other women writers and also supporting the arts generally um, because she married a man who uh, who was not particularly rich but was obviously a, a wealthy man but he had estates in the northeast of England and when coal was discovered these estates become very valuable and although her husband was much older than her and he died sort of um, when she um, in the 1770s she then uh, ensured that these estates made a lot of money and she built this huge house in Portman Square and filled it with sort of artistic things so she so she was an artistic patron but she, she also had these salon where women would gather and talk um, and um, then she wrote thousands of letters I mean there are thousands of letters and there's there's they're creating a digital edition of them which will be fully annotated so and the, the 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 manuscripts uh will be um a digital in digital form but they'll also be annotated so i'm sort of working on that and i'm also trying to write a fiction which is proving extremely difficult um because my family uh were in india and they ran a hotel uh in the 1920s 1930s and i just find there's so many different stories that have come out of that it's actually quite hard to do it as a factual book because there's too many different threads but I suddenly realized that there's one way I could try and draw some of these threads together was through fiction so I'm doing that but I, I do find it quite hard to survive without facts or to have to make everything up um I thought I'd love it because writing biographies and factual books can be very frustrating because you say I'd love to say this but I can't because I don't have ed evidence for it um and so I thought I'd really enjoy writing fiction, which I do, but it's also pretty scary because you um, you just have to fly with it. <laughs> you don't know whether it's got uh, ballast or ground beneath you. You just have to keep going. So, yeah. Great. Well, we do have questions. We've had questions that have been appearing while we've been talking, so that's right. very exciting. <laughs> Um, so the first question we have is, how widely is Fanny Burney taught in literature classes today and in what context? Well, that's very interesting. I mean, I think there's been a big revival of interest in her. Um, the Fanny, the Burney Society was set up originally by some Americans, actually, who were great fans of Jane Austen. And they, they thought, well, actually, there should be a society to Fanny Burney as well. And to begin with, it was kind of just a few enthusiasts really, but now it's become quite a big academic pursuit and there's a UK society, the Fanny Burney Society, so do join if, you, if you're interested. Um, but, uh, and they hold conferences and, and there's been quite a lot of research, but um, she's taught more in America, I think, than she probably is here. They're much more interested in the 18th century in America than they are here. The 18th century is not a hot topic here, much to our distress really. Um, it's fallen out of favor um and um there are there are people who study fanny burney it's sort of master's level but i'm not sure whether evelina would be taught in a, on an undergraduate syllabus here whereas it definitely it would be taught in america that's really interesting i i i wonder if you have i mean other than the fact that they i mean maybe they studied more the 18th century these days in america but i thought it was interesting as well that you said that most of her manuscripts are in places like new york and mm. their projects in in canada yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, i mean it's it crazy that the, the, the bernie center is at mcgill university in montreal and yes it was joyce hemlow who was originally from uh, um nova scotia um was the person who who really got Fanny Burney's studies going again. Her biography was published in something like 54, 55, something like that. And uh, she then decided that she needed to, she wanted to publish, she wanted to um, publish uh, 
um, editions of the of, of the diaries that were that, that were that were carefully edited and, and actually took us back to what Fanny Burney had written because when she was writing her biography she realized how much the, the, the letters had been um, edited and covered over and deleted and stuff like that and even actually in the British Library a lot of them would been pasted and not pasted in sequence so they come out of sequence and uh, so uh, she wanted to put that that right, so she so she started it off, and um, it it's puzzling why, uh, except that I suppose you know America was formed in the eighteenth century, you know through the the, the war uh, of independence, and I, I just think maybe that's why they're interested in it, I, and their constitution is eighteenth century, whereas we, it's kind of fallen out of favor, I think, the eighteenth century because. It, I mean, people like Johnson are regarded as high Tories and, and not, not um, uh, an establishment figures, if you like. They're not, they're not, uh, and uh, they're not just not seen as being uh, um, uh, relevant, really. And I don't quite understand that because I think their insights are in, invaluable. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's hoping for the, um, the Bridgerton effect in that more people <laughs> on this side. <laughs> of uh, the well, Atlantic will be interested in the 18th century. <laughs> I, I think, I think, yes, I think, I think that, that I mean, I think that's a great series because I just think it, 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 it sort of subverts a lot of our preconceived ideas about the 18th century. Yeah, yeah. So the next question that we have from the audience is, um, what was her life in France and Belgium like? Well, um, it, in France, um, she lived in Paris. Her husband was working for the Ministry of the Interior and uh, she, they had an, um, a little house. Um, it, at that time it was just outside, but it's actually very, if anyone's been to Paris, it's very near Balzac's house. Um, and uh, she was there for 10 years. Um, I think she enjoyed it. I don't know. It's really hard to tell um, because she does talk about the experience of, of living under Napoleon and how um, constrained they were. And um, she was I, it was quite difficult because there was always the fear that she would be thought of as an English spy. She was English in France at the, uh, for a large part of that time. France was at war with England. So and um, Darby was in a really difficult position because he was married to an English woman. So, so I think it was quite fraught in that sense. Um, and yeah, in Belgium, she was only in Belgium for a year because Darby goes back. Um, he wants to um, fight for France. Um, and he can't actually fight actively for France because he's married to an English woman. But uh, he does um have a role um rounding up um deserters from the army and bringing them back um and i think she lived an expat life really um she, she just tended to mix with other english people um I think that possibly betrays her slight. She wasn't very European <laughs> in her being. We were talking about her being quite uh, conformist, really. And I think she was, she did a rebellious thing by marrying a, a Frenchman, but I think she was much more at home with English. You know, she wasn't really someone who was naturally at home with different ways of doing things. Well, of course, she had the mastectomy when she was in France. So yeah. I. I don't think that was probably a, um, a great memory from her time there. No, no, I think uh, that was that was that was sort of not long before she came home. Actually, she came home in 1812, didn't she? So, yeah, yeah. But yes. Um, yeah. Um. So um, the next question we have is uh, somebody says, I thoroughly enjoyed Evelina. Which of her books should I read next? Who among her contemporaries should I read? Oh, um, mm, good question. Uh, well, I think Cecilia, her second novel, is a great read and very easy to read. I read it several times and I remember once reading it. I really wasn't very well, but I just sort of, it's the sort of book you could read. Uh, it's it's full of, um, it's not terribly well. I mean, 
structured in the sense that Fanny Rennie loves describing events um, and gets very excited, but her plots tend to be very convoluted. Um, so, and Cecilia is one of those that is a bit convoluted. Um, the Cecilia is an heiress and she, she's not allowed to marry if it means changing her name and, and that causes huge problems, um, which is quite a feminist idea. <laughs> But um, so again, that shows that kind of way in which uh, she, she, she does like to sort of dig away at, at, at established ideas. Um, so I think Cecilia is probably a good one. And then I would go to the Wanderer and possibly not read Camilla, which is very long, very convoluted, has some fantastic short scenes in it. Um, there's a wonderful description of a village performance of Othello, which is hilarious, um, really funny. Um, Othello's beard gets burnt and Desdemona falls off the bed or something, things like that. There's another description of a monkey orchestra, which is quite weird and a bit odd. Um, so there's some great descriptive passages in Camilla, but it is very long. Um, so I would go to C Cecilia next and um, then the Wanderer maybe. Of her contemporaries to read, Charlotte Lennox, um, some of Charlotte Lennox's later novels are fantastic. She's best known for The Female Coyote, which I is the sort of book that you read the first hundred pages and you think this is so original, so clever, it's just brilliant. And then somehow it keeps doing the same thing for the next 300 pages and you kind of get a bit bored by that. Um, I shouldn't really say that, it's a bit shocking because that's a sort of seminal text, The Female Coyote, as a spoof on Cervantes. But, um, some of her latest novels, Euphemia and um, I'm going to forget the name of the other ones, uh, are really interesting. Um, of the other uh, novelists, female novelists, um, Anne Radcliffe, she writes gothic stuff, which if you like gothic is quite interesting but um, I'm not really a great fan of gothic. Uh, the Mysteries of Udolfo is a very strange book and it's worth reading because it's so strange. Um, um, oh but uh, another great person Maria Edgeworth. Um, Belinda is a great interesting novel. Um, Castle Rackrent is her perhaps is much shorter and it's just very funny. She's very funny and much sharper in a way than Fanny Burney and um, but doesn't quite have the something about Fanny Burney, which is very immediate and sort of, and memorable. It takes, you don't forget those little vignettes that she gives you. Um, yeah. So uh, we have time for one more question. Um, and I think this is a good one to end on. Uh, <laughs> is it true that Fanny, Burney, Fanny Burney's writing inspired Jane Austen? Well, yeah, I definitely, definitely. Northanger Abbey has definitely got um, uh, is is um, is influenced by 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 Evelina uh, and possibly Cecilia. Cecilia in Cecilia in 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 uh, has contains a line. This is all about pride. This is all to do with pride and prejudice, and the the there's a, the, the the suggestion is that that, that 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 that's where Jane Austen got her title from, which. I don't think there's documentary evidence for that, but it, it does seem very likely because she definitely had read um, uh, Fanny Bunny and, she, and there's a Miss Austin of Steventon is listed in the subscribers to the Camilla, the novel Camilla. Um, so we know that she, she at least bought that. Um, and um, yes, I think uh, she took that society idea of, of analyzing society from Fanny Burney and refined it to a most um, um, Fanny Burney does not have Jane Austen's sense of style, that sense in which there's not a word that's in the wrong place or there's no kind of overwriting. Um, in Fanny Burney, there's quite a lot of overwriting, but there's also that vigor and joy and just sheer delight in what she's doing that's very infectious 
Well, thank you so much, Kate, for joining us for Ben's Book Club and talking about your book, Fanny Bernie, Her Life. Um, we do have a link of where you can put, purchase the book on our website, www.benjaminfranklinhouse.org, should you want to get your own copy. Um, and we also have links to the project that uh, Kate mentioned about Elizabeth Montague on there. So if you're interested, oh, brilliant. please yeah. do visit our website. Um, but uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Um, and thank you, Kate. Well, thank you very much. It's been great to have an opportunity to talk about her after a bit of a while. So thank you. Very much enjoyed it. And great questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm glad to hear that. And th this, there is a recording of this session. So um, if you would like to revisit it or share it, um, please do. It will be available on our website as well. So um, thank you, everyone. And have a good evening or afternoon, depending on where you're based in the world. And um, thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>